beautiful things. Right, so as I was saying, these matrices are critical to the exam because most of them or a lot of them will come in the exam in some form. Um, so we will deal with, uh, we'll touch briefly on the BCG matrix, but I wouldn't deal a lot with that, and you would have covered that in your marketing. And uh, we will look at the, what is called a space matrix. And they said, I, I hope you would have read ahead, they said normally it's good to read ahead that you would have an understanding of the subject matter. Um, so you have the space matrix that we'll look at. We'll look at the IE matrix, and we would also look at the grand strategy matrix. Those three in particular. Look, the lady. Is she coming up? Yeah, she's driving. She's driving. She just left. She's gonna be there. Yeah. So I don't, I wouldn't start until she comes there. Just give her a chance. You know the lady that has the walker, so just give her a little chance to get in. Now the, sorry? Yes, so folks, just a little housekeeping stuff to remind you that the tutorials are intended for you to be able to get familiar with concepts, and to test your knowledge and understanding of concepts. Huh? So the tutorials are not intended to come not doing anything and looking to listen to what people say and take notes. Maybe you can do that in the counseling or something. But the tutorials are intended for interactive discussion for you to clarify concepts and ideas. Um, so I've realized from the beginning of semester a number of people have been exempting themselves from tutorial. Like, and I, I know working people would have a problem during the day, but surely not the evenings. And I do a six to seven, seven to eight on Monday, and a six to seven on Tuesday, which would cater to the working people. But I've realized a substantial of a number of students during the day don't, have not been coming to tutorials. But I can assume maybe they, set, they came to the conclusion that what I said at the beginning of the semester was junk. When they say that the course is not a course, you read the text. You wait to the end of the semester, read the text, and pass the course. So if they believe they can do it, well, they can try it. I don't see how you can do it, but maybe they're geniuses. So we'll see what happens. But, so when today, after today's lecture, you will see the point I'm making. Uh, the text does not explain the interrelationships and the interconnections that are necessary within the context of the exam. Right? And as they said before, that your role in the exam will be one of consultant. Right? You're not a student writing an essay. You are a consultant advising a business, and you have to analyze um, financial documents, analyze matrices, and give recommendations. You do the analysis, and you make recommendations to the company as a manager. So it's not a true essay. A lot of the questions are not essays. So it calls for your analytic, the same thing we do in class and in tutorial, it calls for your analytical skills, your critical thinking skills, so it's not essay type questions for most of the exam. And I just want to make that clear. So if you're thinking that you can read, you read and do the, and write an essay, very few of the questions are actually will be essays. Right? And I want to reiterate, there will be questions for you as a consultant advising a business, and your role is to conduct analysis of the documents and then make recommendations. Right? So the essay writing is actually a minor part of your, of your final exam. Right? Um, so the other thing in terms of housekeeping would be the cases we have, I've, in fact, I uploaded the, the Disney and I sent out an email. So the Disney and another case I want to do are intended to help you to practice using the concepts and tools and techniques that will come in the exam, right? So doing this com these comprehensive cases are intended to help you prepare for exam, right? And that's why the, in the, I sent you note indicated in doing these cases, they're comprehensive cases. That's why I said do it in groups that you can share the responsibility. So you can have one section of the group maybe doing the, um, e the PESTI and the SWAT, maybe EFE, somebody else will do the IFE and CPM or five forces. So you allocate different responsibilities. Somebody looks at developing an EFE or IFE 
or the matrices, the space matrix, the grand strategy, so that people share responsibilities. And then again, you find time in the group to discuss and share what you're preparing. So you don't have to be here with technology. You can utilize so much technology to, to meet. You can meet on, um, on Skype. You can have a meeting on Skype. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be um, physically here to have a meeting with any student, you see. And so it's flexible, right? But I want to stress uh, one of the things that will prepare you well for the exam is finding time to talk strategy right? with your colleagues, have discussions, right? Like we do in class or we do in tutorials, talk strategy, um, analyze matrices, analyze tools, and discuss among yourself to show that I understand the concepts, right? So talking it. And having discussions are much more important than just sitting on reading it on your own or cramming at the last minute and trying to read, you see. Um, sorry? Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. That's good. Okay. Um, so, as I said, the key, critical thing would be for you now, since we know the exam time is set, and like, okay, we're going to shut down about week 11. This is week, this is week what, seven? Right. So we just have about four more weeks in class, which is going into mid-November. And then from there, you know, we're going to close and just, just do, have a tutorial the following week. But it's basically then for you to be able to find time uh, to do your preparations. Okay. Now, on the positive side, I'm, I'm confident and comfortable that a number of the students who have been coming to tutorials from the interaction, it is clear to me they're understanding the linkages, they're understanding the concepts, you know. You might forget a definition, but I think conceptually, a number of students really are understanding these interrelationships and the interconnections and the, of the various concepts, um, which are the most critical things necessary for you going into the exam. So that is good. So all I would say to the students who really are, are, getting, are having a good understanding of the, of the course and the concepts and the, the, the theories, that you actually find time to share with your colleagues. If there's a colleague struggling with a particular concept, just find some time to share with them and help them. And I'm sure there's something that you might not know that they might be able to help you with. Right? So that kind of sharing, again, I find works best in this course. We are really sharing information with your colleagues and helping them actually to come along. Okay. So any questions so far? Any questions, any comments, any issues you have before we get into the, the meeting of the matter? Right, so even if you couldn't afford the text, I, think, I know a number of your colleagues said you could actually go online and get a version in Google. Right? So it basically covers the same stuff. So there's no reason to say I don't have the text. Right? So all I'm urging you again is that the reading the notes are not enough. Right? The notes are just basic guidelines. You still have to read the text. The text is quite detailed or any other reading so you can have deeper understanding of concepts especially those ratings, right? The ratings for the EFE, for the CPM, for the IFE, you need to understand how those ratings work, you see? Um, so sometimes the notes don't give you enough explanation of these things, right? So I'm sure most of you, if not all, would know when we talk about the IFE, a four and an IFE is, a four and an IFE is a major strain for three years of Minus strength and a two is a and a one. You sure? Two is what? Minor weakness or major weakness? And it, one is right, one is the major weakness. Because the one is the lowest that you could actually get, correct. You see, and you know it differs from the EFE. So what the ratings in the EFE look to do? What are you doing when you're rating in an EFE? Sorry? You're looking at the responses. Excellent. You're looking at responses, responses to to the external environment. So you're looking, something is happening outside of my organization, and I'm looking at how the company responds to the opportunities and how it responds to the threats. Whereas with the IFE, it is internally doing an assessment of yourself, acknowledging do I have a strength, do I have a weakness? Right? So those two conceptual ideas, again, um, just reading it in the text don't give you the idea how it works. It is better for you to have the interactive discussion and be part of it. So I want to urge you folks for the next coming weeks to get the best benefits of the class, you know, participate, get involved. Um, so from 
from next week, what I'll be doing, I actually printed some of the financial ratio statements today, but I, I said I, I think these are much more important since they are covered in the exam. But so from next week, week after, I will bring copies of financial ratios, copies of EFEs, and we'll just analyze them as it would be expected to do in the exam. Yeah? I bring a CPM and we'll analyze it according to exam conditions. I bring a grand strategy matrix. So we're just doing analysis. So for, to, to come to write what we say, this is not going to help you because the exam is going to have a totally different. It, so if I give you a matrix now, the matrix that you get in the exam will have totally different sets of information and, and criteria. So to take notes really uh, without understanding is not really going to help you in any way. Right? So the first thing I want to share with you is the background to strategic analysis and choice, which is looking at long-term objectives um, and best alternatives to achieve the mission. And if you look here, this slide is basically saying the point I mentioned back in week one and two. When we start to look at the matrices, the assumption is it relates to the vision, it relates to the mission, it relates to the objectives, it relates to the external audit, it relates to the internal audit, and it relates to past successful strategies, and we dealt with strategies last week. But so, so when we say the external audit, what, what particular tools or techniques we use or we um, would have discussed in the external audit? Pestle analysis, Porter's five forces, EFE, CPM to some extent, and the internal, we looked at the IFE, right? SWOT analysis at the strengths and weaknesses aspect of the SWOT, you see? So all of those processes are part of the external. And then the strategies, last week we dealt with all of the competitive strategies. So everybody by now should know when we say intensive strategies. When we say intensive strategies, what are we talking about? Intensive strategies are anybody? Sorry? Market penetration, market development, and market penetration. Those are the intensive strategies. And we know the vertical integration strategies are the backward, forward, and horizontal integration. Right? Um, so you need to in understanding these strategies, are these matrices, these are some concepts that you would need to know. Um, the diversification strategies, we talked about different types of diversification strategies. We talked about defensive strategies. Give me two defensive strategies. Sorry? Liquidation. Retrenchment. And what happens when you have six units and you shut down one? Divestiture, right? Give me an aggressive strategy. Aggressive strategy. Right, a hostile takeover. Some people call it acquisitions. Right, just, just give us a minute. So maybe do that review. So we, we're talking about these different integration strategies. The other thing, folks, is that next week, your quiz will deal with value chain analysis, basically. Right? And I will say to you that value chain analysis, again, will be found in your exam. I can tell you that. If you look at the past papers, every year, a question comes on value chain analysis. And even if a question does not come on value chain analysis, when you're answering your other questions, it will have to refer to some aspect of value chain analysis, you see. Um, 
So, so I said there are some basic concepts that you will not be tested on again. So like you wouldn't find a question looking specifically what is a mission, what is a vision, what is business model. Those are concepts we assume that you should know. What is the business model um, and the relationship to the value chain and the various elements of a value chain, right? How are the integration strategies related to the value chain? But for sure, the value chain would be one of those questions which, that you will get in the exam, right? In some form. You don't know the form in which you, it will be there, but it will come in some form. So again, I urge you to spend some time practicing looking at value chain, but not only the elements of the value chain, <coughs> but the relationships that the value chain would have the other concepts. So for example, one of the things you should know is how is the value chain related to a business model? Maybe that is just one on one. How is it related to the business model, the value chain? Yes, lady right here. How is value chain related to the business model? Ways that you are. So, wait. Right, so, well, it's spending, but there's another, another major thing that is linked to the core purpose of a value chain cost management. Right. So, how then is it related then to the business model? Sorry? Go ahead. How is the value chain then directly achieved? Nearly close, how is it related to the business model? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. A little louder. It uses. Right, so the value chain focuses on cost drivers. It looks at cost advantages and disadvantages. So hence, it is related to the business model because Related to business model then because because you're talking about the business model. You're saying in a business, how is it related to the business model? Correct, because the value chain has three components. It looks at revenue but it also looks at your cost management strategy, how to manage costs in order to make their profit. Right? So that's the relationship that it looks at costs. We haven't started, but just trying to talk, talk to UK. <laughs> no problem. Just take your time, don't rush. <laughs> right. So it looks at the value chain, looks at managing costs, or so the business model cost management dimension is also critical to understanding the value chain. You should also know that relationship between the five forces, analysis, and value chain. So somebody tell me, what's that relationship between the five forces, analysis, and value chain? So, so, you, so you're excellent, correct. So you talk about the bargaining problem supplier. So which aspect specifically of the value chain could you align that to? When you talk about the bargaining part of the supplier. Inbound logistics, why? Right, because, go ahead. All right, she's correct, excellent. She's saying because inbound logistics looks at where you source your supplies and where you interact with suppliers. So if you did, if you are in a value chain looking to have the most e efficient processes, you will look at your inbound logistics, which looks at uh, accessing your su supplies. Good work. <laughs> right, where you would have sourced your supplies. Hence, your point about the bargaining power of the supplier is critical 
So we move from there then to say, well, if the bargaining power of the supplier is low, what are the implications for value chain management? If the bargaining power of the supplier then is low, what are the implications for inbound logistics of the value chain? Yes, go ahead. That you are? The cost will be? I say if the bargaining power of the supplier is low. It means that, correct, excellent, it means that I as the company, when I am sourcing my supplies, I have so many choices. So I can push prices down. So I can say, well, if you don't give me a discount of 10%, I am going to the competitor. And the more choices, the less bargaining power, and the more power I have at the person buy. And hence, as a result of that, my benefits then are, what I have bargaining power. My benefits are in this value chain then are, and then once I have control of that, what is benefit coming from there? My cost of production then will be? And I can then give my customers what? Better prices and quality. Cheaper, but I don't like the word cheap so much as it is a stronger word that we hear in the value chain. Value for money. You see, cheap could be cheap. But if I say value for money, in other words, it is not a cheap product, but because I was able to manage my costs and negotiate better prices from suppliers, I was able then to also capture the value for money. But you see the difference. Cheap could be that it's just a cheap product that is selling at a low price. But if I have a good a product, a product that is pretty good, but I'm able to push costs down, I can sell customers at the best price. So it is value for money and not necessarily a cheap product. So if I link this now to the five generic competitive strategies. Which of those, which category of generic competitive strategy would speak to this issue of whether it is just trying to get a cheap or low cost product versus an alternative? Value for money. Which aspect of the five generic strategies speaks to that? Cost leadership, because cost leadership speaks about low cost, and best value. So which one would be with generally getting the lowest cost, maybe to get the cheapest prices? Low cost or best value? Which one speaks to the point about just having cheap products, the cheapest products on the market in terms of price? The low cost, right? And then best value would be, it's more relative when you compare it to your customers. Excellent. Okay, we can now move into the lecture. So you see, folks, at the end, what is it saying here? Before we even talk about matrices, we need to deal with this input stage of EFE, IFE, and CPM. So in other words, if you don't know them, you're going to have trouble in understanding these matrices that we look at very shortly. Right? So these are the ones we already dealt with SWOT. I'm not going to look at that. I will basically maybe just touch on the BCG, but the three today that I will focus on, especially in preparing for your exam, is the space matrix, the IE matrix, and the grand strategy matrix. So the first one I'm going to look at, I'll pass this what I will look at the space matrix. And it's covered quite extensively in your text. So it is strategic position and action matrix, action evaluation matrix, and it has four quadrants that you should know well. It has the aggressive, conservative, defensive, and competitive matrices. So we will look at those shortly. So folks, when we are talking about matrices, there's something very critical that you need to pay attention to.
So I will take my time. I'm not going to rush it. But anytime I say anything nobody understands clearly, just put your hand up or say, Dr. Corbin, can you go over? A king to love, can you go over? So one of the first things we need to understand before we look at analyzing matrices is understanding the basic axes, the x-axis, the y-axis. Because going, these matrices use a lot of vectors and plotting coordinates and interpretation of them. So one of the first things you will do when you are looking at a matrix is to look at the axes and then look at the value, which, so a bit of math looking at the number line. Is it at the positive side of the number line or is it at the negative side? Because a lot of students get mixed up when it gets to the negative aspect of the number line. Which is the bigger value, right? Which is the bigger value, minus one or minus six? You sure? Yes. Correct. Right, but again, some students get it mixed up. And when you put it in a matrix, sometimes, when you then add, if you look here, when you have all minuses, it might be okay. But when you're mixing a minus and a plus, that would happen in this quadrant. Or a minus and a plus, that could happen in this quadrant, students get mixed up, right? So go back and just refresh your memory, the number line, anytime you feel you're getting a bit confused. So as I said, the key thing about the matrices, they're going to be focusing on interpretation of the axes and this number line. So in the space matrix, you have internal dimensions and you have external dimensions. So folks, that's one of the concepts in this course that you need to understand that it's fundamental. If you go back to lecture one, a fundamental principle we followed was some things are external and some things are internal. And that would follow you into the exam. If you don't understand that basic concept, that strategy is about dealing with external forces which are beyond your control and impact on you versus internal forces that you can control. That is a basic premise that we need to understand. So what we are saying here, there are some internal dimensions to, strategy, to this matrix of space that we said financial position and competitive position, meaning I can deal with how competitive I am. Right? I develop my own competitive strategies. Everybody with me? Now, the other thing I would bring to your attention that even in the space matrix, and when we go to the grand strategy, there are implications for understanding financial issues and financial management. So you really can't say, I am not dealing with anything with finance in the course. You, at some point, accounting and finance will be dealt with in the course. So in this dimension, it looks at financial position. The external now talk, will talk about the environmental position and the industry position. Right? The environmental position and the industry position. And we'll look at some um, ways to define those. Now, I just want to clarify something before we go ahead. If you are using an older version of the text from online, the language, David, the author, changed the language within the last couple of years. So currently, the one I have in bracket is what is used in the text that I'm using, which is the 15th edition. I think if you go back maybe to the 13th or 12th, it might say financial stability. But it's the same thing. So if you are using an old online version, please make a note that when we say financial position, in my slides, it re relates to financial stability in the older version. When I say competitive position, in the old version, David says competitive advantage. Right? So please make a note. And when I say environmental position, right, the, he talks about the environmental stability. He talks about environmental stability. Uh, in fact, it should be stability position, sorry. It's really stability position. And when he talk, when I talk about industry position, the old version talks about industry stability, right? So, but it's the same concept, but it's just the different versions. He, he started to use a different language. So when we say financial position, we are talking about return on investment, leverage, liquidity, cash flow, etc. And everybody should know what those mean. When we talk about stability position, we are talking about technological changes, 
rate of inflation, barriers to entry, elasticity of demand, right? So we're talking about the environment within which the business operates and how stable trying to assess the stability of that environment. And when we talk about competitive position, we're talking about market share, product quality, customer loyalty, etc. And in terms of industry position, we are talking about the growth potential, right? Growth potential, profit potential, and resource utilization, etc. Right? So you can learn those and understand those definitions. So when you are, and the text gives further details, I won't go into those details today. That's something you can read up on your own. But in order to plot the y-axis in the space matrix, you have to take the calculation for the financial position and the calculation for the stability position add and add them. That's what, that's what you get and divide by whatever number. That you're basically doing averages. And then you take the the competitive position and the industry position to create the x-axis. So what would happen then, you would plot a vector that if we say 4, 5, or negative 3, 3, or 3, negative 2, That's what we're talking about. You're plotting to determine where, where the vector is going and where the company, company X, is located. So if this was Walmart, if, Walmart, if you had th three different times you were taking the space, so in year one, this is where it was, year two, and year three. So if we assume we are assessing Walmart for year one, it is saying then that it is in the aggressive quadrant, and if we look at year two, we're saying it is in the competitive quadrant, and then for the conservatives, if we say the year three. So, but if that vector and the point that you would pay attention to, that tells you where the company falls. So, so wherever you plot the company, it is where David, in the text, argues he proposes a set of competitive strategies. And when you look at the competitive strategies, you will see the interrelationship I spoke about um, during the course. So, in, so what he is arguing then, when you are developing a space matrix, you're looking at financial matters. You're looking, you would have to have done a SWOT. You would have had to have done your five forces analysis. You would have had to have done your competitive pro profiling. Um, CPM, etc., and then he's proposing you would see in the matrices, and in fact, in all of the matrices, competitive strategies that we dealt with last week come. So, what I'm saying to you folks, you cannot go into the exam not knowing your competitive strategies extremely well. Right? I repeat, you cannot go into the exam not knowing all of your competitive strategies very well, meaning you need to know your intensive strategies, you need to know your integration strategies. You need to know your five generic competitive strategies. You need to know your defensive strategies and your offensive. All, not some, all. Because they will come throughout the exam in some form, right? In some form, I repeat, they will come through the exam questions in some form. So is there anything you can spot? I just learned the, the uh, integration strategy. You need to learn all and know all very, very well. So here we are seeing in this matrix, it deals with nearly all. It deals with, you see what I'm saying? It deals with backward integration, forward integration, horizontal integration, the intensive strategies, and even diversification strategies, if that's in the aggressive quadrant. If it is defensive, it deals with retrenchment, divestiture, liquidation. If it is competitive, it deals with the integration strategies, and you realize there's overlap. And in the other quadrant, the conservative, it deals with market penetration and diversification that is related. And we know when we say related diversification, it is related because, anybody can tell me? We dealt with that before. It is related because, somebody. 
you're doing something similar, but it's something deeper to your correct, but there's, it's the same product line, and it's linked to that. Sorry? The same, same core competencies, correct? What else? One more critical thing. Excellent. But say it low. They want, don't want me to say it for you. Correct. It uses basically the same value chain processes. Right? She's excellently correct. And because it uses this basically the same value chain processes, the same level of competencies and product processes, we call it related. Unrelated is that the value chain processes are significantly different, which means then your competency would be different. You're going into something totally new, which has implications then for the, you know, to getting it done well. So I said, in this case, we have plotted the vector, and we say that the company is in the defensive quadrant, right? We say, but then the other thing you need to look at, folks, one of the first things you would look to see then, we have a numbering for the axes. So all companies in the defensive quadrant are not equal, because you need to make a choice, which of these might be best. So how do you know which might be the best alternative for the company? So in this one, somebody tell me what is happening there in this one. What is happening with this company? Somebody tell me. Stagnant, what else? What is happening with this company? Sorry? Right, but I wanted to look at the matrix and use the matrix to analyze and tell me what's happening with this company. Sorry? They're unstable, but again, remember I said the axes are very critical to interpreting matrices. So look at the axes and tell me what is happening. Look at the axes. What are the axes saying? This is the stability position. Right, same as the environmental stability. And this one is competitive position. So what does it say then on the x-axis? So remember some are internal, some are external. So which dimension as we said before, which factors are internal? Financial position and competitive position. So when we look at the financial position, which is this one, sorry, the competitive position, what is it saying about the company? It is, sorry? But what is it saying about the competitive position? Look at the numbers. Sorry? It is. It is negative. So what is it saying about the competitive? It's on a scale from negative 1 to negative 6. Moderate in terms of its competitive position. And moderate because, don't forget, this, remember I said before, which is the, 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 uh, the, the number that has the highest value, right? So this, because the numbers are negative, don't mean we are saying that anything happens here that is negative. It's just the way of, of, um, the axes are, right? But in terms of value, a company that falls at negative six, is it worse off or better off than a company at negative three? It's worse off. So she's correct to say it's moderate in terms of its competitive position. It's moderate. And what did you say then about its stability position? So is the stability position internal or external? external. You understand? So it's not that it is not doing very good. You see the difference? You don't understand? Let's go back over again. Let's go back to the slide that is important. You remember we said up here, there are two factors that are internal, which are the financial position and the competitive position. Everybody with me? They are internal. 
And then we say they are two external, which are the environmental or the stability position and the industry position. And the environmental stability is there a stable environment versus the industry. And the industry would be the industry relates to all the businesses that are producing particular unique products, whether the industry for tables, industry for computers, industry for cars. Right? So when we come down here now, all it is saying is putting it in a matrix. So anything that falls from here would be part of the competitive position, which is internal. And anything that goes up there as part of financial are internal. The only external dimension then would be anything that falls here or anything that falls here. Those are external. So if you say that it is not doing very well in terms of the stability position, it is not it because that's an external factor. Correct. It is seen here in this particular uh, environment. Okay. In this environment, well, we have right, we have plotted it at negative five. Is negative five closer to the lowest end of environmental stability? So, what is it saying then, saying then about this environment? High risk, yes, it is challenging, right? It is a bit unstable, that's what it's saying about the particular environment, right? This could have to do where it is. Is it in China? It is in North Africa? It is in Iraq? And then it is saying here, when it comes to the industry position, the industry position, what is it saying about the industry position? That it doesn't fall there. But if the, if the axis was here, if the axis was here, it would speak specifically to the industry position. So in this one, you need to make a decision. Would I prefer retrenchment? Would I prefer divestiture? Or would I prefer liquidation? And your role is to advise the company on what is best for the company. Right? With other things being equal. You're saying that the external environment is I would say robust while I don't know robust. It's challenging. It's challenging. Right. Right. And that is hard for me to for my business to really grow or develop or whatever produce in that environment. And you have but you have to say in relation to its competitive position. Oh right. But it's just mid range, you see? Right. So it suggests then that the company is having some challenges and uh, retrench so what it, so when when it is having these challenges, why would you take these actions? Why would these actions be taken? Because because you're trying to reduce costs. And when we say trying to reduce costs, what tool or technique we said is necessary to understand where you can reduce costs? The value chain. So what I'm saying to you that even in answering a question like this, you have to mention about value chain and answers. But these suggest that there are areas of high cost that you're trying to reduce. So you will still have to speak to some issue related to value chain using your logical and analytical um, capability. That's it. So divestiture means I'm going to shut down my unit. Retrenchment means I'm going to cut staff. And liquidation means I'm going to shut down. Now the other thing here too, folks, every exam has financial statements. And all are linked. So if you get a space matrix, a grand strategy matrix, an IE matrix, a CPM, a financial ratio, all of them will be for the same company and like. So in order to answer this, you need to go and look at your financial ratios. What is it saying about sales? What is it saying about profitability? And if there's a CPM, 
you have to go and look at the CPM also. What does the CPM say? In fact, in the exam, I say it's a running kit. So the exam is like a mini kit. So when you analyze your CPM and you analyze your ratio, it helps you to come to a decision which is the most appropriate strategy then for me to utilize. And it's not about being perfect. Folks, I'm not looking for you to come up with the perfect. In other words, I ain't got the answer. Yes, divestiture. I want to see how you logically can argue. So one student might say retrenchment, another student might say divestiture, another student might say liquidation. Or some people might say both, both divestiture and retrenchment. So I'm not interested in that everybody comes up with the same answer. I'm interested in your logical thinking. How do you come to this conclusion? What kind of arguments did you bring? Do you realize you had to link it back to the financials? Did you refer to certain financials? Did you refer to the fact that the value chain might, analysis might be necessary to look at areas of high cost? So the cost might have been in your secondary value chain. So you can mention things, the possibilities. Yeah. But a case can't give you everything, so you can make assumptions, you see? So I'm looking for the fact that you can argue and justify why you're coming to a conclusion. And that's what you will get your marks for, logical and strong argument to defend whatever position you come with, you see? So I don't have an answer that, I, that you must answer this in this way, which makes it easy for you, right? It makes it easy for you that you don't have to try to remember what I wanted to say, which is wrong. It is up to you to convince me that you understand the linkages. I know that whole value chain is linked to business model. I know how financial ratios. I know how, if you have cash flow problems, how it can impact on your ability to pay your money. I know that when I look at your gross sales versus your net sales, if I look at your gross sales and net sales and realize the margins are very close, what does it tell me? What does it tell me? Sorry? I feel like your growth sales and net sales and the margins are very narrow. What does it tell me? That you barely, barely make any profit. That you, your costs are so high. Your costs are so high that something is eating up all the capability. In other words, your sales are high, but your costs are just as high. So you barely make any profit. You want wide margins that you have big profit. Grow sales and keep your costs down as much as possible that you can have big profit. That's what company, companies want. Yes? If it's common, no, nothing is common. <laughs> companies don't do all kind of weird things. People do radical decisions. People, they may, don't forget a lot, of, a lot of what is written in the text is a textbook explanation, not real life. But in real life, any companies can make any radical uh, uh, product recommends in five competitive strategies, you only use one at a time. But some companies mix up everything. So I'm saying to you, I'm not interested in, in that you have my answer. I'm interested in how you're thinking. And, and, and you're showing to me I understand the concepts. I understand the theory. Right? That I understand. I recommend retrenchment. But when I recommend retrenchment, there are implications when you retrench. What are the implications when they retrench? Huh? Implications for the company when you retrench. What are the implications? Hmm? Excellent. And what else too? Could be confident knowledge. You could lose critical knowledge. It's, that's it. But suppose you're unionized. The Caribbean is heavily unionized. You see, so that's one look at. So when you retrench, it is not just sending home workers. There are implications of sending home workers. As you said, the issue that you have a reduced force. Are the workers who remain going to work harder? Are you going to pay them more? So there's still, there are implications. So that's the kind of discussion. But don't forget this. That, no. no. But what, not all of that. What I'm saying is that the line he might want to take. Not all of that. <laughs> not what I'm saying. Not all of that. No, 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 no. I might say that it might. But no, you don't. Hold on. You don't have okay. to say that. Okay. That is the line that he will take. No, 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 no. I understand that. But what I am saying that I will come up with a different thing. Cor so I Correct. In other words, you don't have to mention that staff might have to work harder. That might be his line. You might come with a totally different angle. 
that is logical and analytical, like the point, loss of competence, distinctive competence. And when you lose distinctive competence, what are you losing? Sorry? A competitive advantage because, because what? Why are you losing the competitive advantage when you lose distinctive competencies? Yes. But why, when you lose distinctive competencies, what are you losing? What gives you the competitive edge? Tacit knowledge. And what is important about tacit knowledge? You cannot imitate it. And it is rare. So when you say that, what you're saying then? You will then argue, and this now is where the resource-based view is necessary because you're going to refer to the theories. You understand? Excellent. So the company needs to be careful that it does not retrench workers who have distinctive competency. So, folks, you're going to read this in the textbook. You see what we discussed just now? You could read a million textbooks, they will not explain that to you the way we explained it just now. And I would guarantee you. That if next week, if I ask the average student about this discussion, the average student will remember it. Yeah. No one will forget it, you see. Because it's real life, we are talking through the stuff. Yes. If you. Well, well that's what the internal audit is about. That's a very good point. The internal audit is looking at all aspects of your internal resources. You understand? That's what the internal audit is about. Your human resources, management, strategy, structure, custom, system, processes. Right? So the point I'm making, folks, there are so many different ways that students can answer a question, logically and analytically referring to the concepts. Refer Once you refer to the concepts and theories and arguing your case, you're going to get your points. I'm not looking for you to give me a rote answer. I want to know your thinking. So it's not about you give me one on one is two. Yeah, one on one and two is a straight line. But we're talking about a business here. Are you analyzing the business environment and showing me you understand that it is not perfect and there are different options and capabilities, but you understand the theory, you understand the concept, you understand the relationship, and you understand, as your colleague said, but when I retreat staff, it is people I'm sending home. And when I send home people, it has implications for the people remain. It has implications for losing competencies, especially your distinctive competencies. Right? So the company needs, so when you, and you, and the exam, you will have to recommend strategies. So you need to be able to recommend the, the, the positives, but also the negative implications of all of these things, you see? So that's why I'm saying to you folks, the next three or four, week, four weeks are critical because what's what we're doing now, we're going to be doing it consistently, preparing you for exams so you understand how to conduct the appropriate analysis. And, and by just looking at this, you would realize the integrationness I said to you that because this assumes you know a whole set of stuff that came before to be able to understand this simple matrix, you see. Any more questions on it? So that's the space matrix. And practice it among yourselves, colleagues. The other one now is the, which is an interesting one. Hey, move from here, dog. <laughs> now, folks, this our e matrix is a very interesting one, you know, right? Because in order to do the IE matrix, you first need to do an EFE and then an IFE. You understand? In order to understand and complete the IE matrix, you first need to do the IE matrix, the IFE, and the EFE. And in order to do an EFE, what do you need to do first? A person analysis, a SWOT analysis, uh, to some extent maybe a five forces analysis. And in order to do the IFE, you still have to do the strength and weakness component of the SWOT. It has to be related still to your broad person analysis of the internal and external environment and the five forces before you can actually think about doing an, an, an IFE matrix. See, understand what I'm saying, folks? 
And the same interpretation, because when I'm analyzing an IE matrix, I'm looking at my strengths and weaknesses. And the strengths and weaknesses could relate to financial stuff, human resources, marketing capabilities. And I need to know about my EFE, right? And what I urge you to do, folks, the best way to understand something, which I want you to do with the comprehensive cases, is to practice doing them. So, so what I want us to do for next week, while you sent the case, is to calculate the IFE and the EFE and CPM for Disney. I want you to practically construct one. And folks, it's not about being perfect. It's just about practicing to know their opportunities. Right? So you can select about between three to five opportunities, three to five threats, three to five strengths, three to five weaknesses, right? logical ones, and then start to construct your EFE, opportunities, threats to the weights, the ratings, and then do the CPM, do the IFE, practice those things, folks, and I guarantee you, even if you practice one from scratch, when you're finished, you would understand those matrices so well that it helps you then even in preparation for the exam. I'm not going to put you wrong. Now, this is the, an example of the space, the, sorry, the IE matrix. It looks a bit confused, but we'll go through it separately. So it has nine, you can see, nine, um, I won't say quadrants, but for a loose term. So it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And if you see the ratings, the ratings are all consistent with the ratings we give in the IFE and EFE from one to four. So it means you need to do it. I have the IE matrix. You need to understand those ratings. So the top on the x-axis, we have the that's the IFE scores, and on the y-axis, you have the EFE scores. So that's what we are saying. On the x-axis is the IFE scores. And on the y-axis, the EFE scores. So all you will do, take the scores from the EFE, the IFE, which is on the x-axis. So assume the company, let's assume I should have actually put in the spot. Assume the company fell, um, it had a score of 3.5. Right? Assume the company had a score of 3.5 for the IFE, right? 3.5 for the IFE and a score of 3 for the EFE, right? So it would be 3.5 for the IFE and 3 for the EFE, right? Because these are the ratings, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then it goes 1, 2, 3, 4. Everybody see the rating? So this is the rating we will give in the, in the EFE and IFE. Between 1 to 4, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, and then for the IFE, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we say the company has a score for the IFE of 3.5, which brings it here, and it got a 3 for the EFE, which brings it here. Okay. So in terms of the IE matrix, if you see the, the patches that are drawn out, for this first one, which includes one, two, and four, it is grow and build. It is not showing on the board, but it's called grow and build. And there are specific strategies recommended for that, grow and build. And in the next patch, which would have three, five, and seven, it is recommended what it calls a hold and maintain strategy. And thirdly, for six, eight, and nine, it is recommending harvest and, digest, and divest. Right? That's what is recommended um, by David, who constructed it. So this company then falls in. The 3.53 falls within which one? Right? Grow and build. Right? And for grow and build, there are some recommended strategies that I didn't put up there. And the recommended strategies, again, would be the integration strategies and the intensive strategies. Right. The, all the integrated strategies and uh, 
the intensive strategies are recommended. So what, which one would you choose? They are rich, it falls in different quadrants, which means the ratings are different. So if a company falls here, which is about 2.5, 3.5, that those scores mean something different to a company that gets 3.54. And they all still fall within this particular category of go and build. So based on where the, the IFT scores and the EFT scores fall, you will then able, be, will be able to logically analyze it and come to your recommendations and conclusions about what is happening within the matrix. If it falls in the harvest and, di and divest, if you look at the scores, the scores are where? Where are the scores for harvest and divest? One, which means, and if you remember, I have one in the a uh, one and two in the IFE, with, right? One uh, one in the IFE means major weakness and a two minor weakness, which means in terms of the company's strength, internal strength, it is weak. When it comes now to the hold and maintain. Where does it fall? It stretches from the 1.5, I'm looking at the IFC, the, the IFC factor, 1.5 all up to nearly in the four range. So you again have to make a determine a determination about the rating. Even though they are in the same category, a company here would have a rating of 2.5 for the IFC. And the 2.5 means that the company, again, just moderate. A company falling here, high for the IFE, but for the EFE, it is low. So it means it's very strong internally, but it has not been. It could be that, but what else? If it is low for the EFE, what does it suggest? Sorry? The competition? Could be the competition, what else? But what does it suggest generally when a company gets such a low score for the EFE? It's not managing. Excellent. It is not responding well to the threats in the external environment. And it's not taking advantage of its opportunities. Excellent. That's what it means. It, is, right? it has a lot of strengths, but it's not really taking advantage enough. Right? So it's like a company that has an excellent product but it's not getting it to market properly because you don't understand the market. Okay. The competitors out there are doing better in marketing their product than you. They're taking advantage of government benefits. They are upgrading their technology. Right? They're taking advantage of government incentives. They are implementing advanced technology. They're going to negotiate deals and getting special benefits. Right, you see? So they have a good product internally but they're not taking advantage of the opportunities as much as they can. So a good product in itself will not lead a company to gain a competitive advantage. Any more questions on the IFE, uh, sorry, on the IE matrix? Anybody want to go over anything in the IE matrix? Which is, no, but it's in the text. If you have the text, it's covered in the text, you see? But it's not, yeah, it wasn't in the site. I'll put up this version. But all of these, the textbook has about two, three, or four different versions of it. Right? So you can see it in the text. It is a section that looks at the strategic analysis and choice. It's covered in the text. Any more questions on the IE matrix? Sorry? Yeah. Quite a bit. Just a reflection of the IFE and EFE. And uh, the final one, the grand strategy matrix, uh, it looks at two things competitive position and market growth. That's what it looks at competitive position 
and market growth. So on the x-axis, you have competitive position, and on the y-axis, you have market growth. So it's either the market is growing rapidly or whether the market is growing slowly, and it's whether the company is in a strong competitive position or whether the company is in a weak competitive position. And just like the space matrix, you realize, and the IE, it deals with both external and internal factors, right? So in this case, the competitive position would be your internal factor and the market growth, which is you don't have control over the market. It is unless you're a monopoly. So similar to the space matrix and to some extent the IE matrix, you need to learn the quadrants very well. So in other words, you need to know in quadrant one what factors fall within quadrant one, what factors fall within quadrant two, three, and four. Because under exam conditions, you're not going to get the, all of this information wouldn't be filled in. If you get a matrix like this in the exam, it will just have the axes, and then it would have quadrant one, two, three, four, and it would just have something plotted. It will just have a plotted. So it could be like here, in this case, it falls in quadrant one. But you wouldn't have the words. You will just have the vector and something plotted. Your job then is to determine which quadrant it falls within. And from there, you need to do the appropriate analysis. So it's quite similar to the space, right? So the numbers aren't here, but we can assume you have ratings from 1 to 6 in the positive, the x and y axes, and then you have 1 to 6 in the negative, um, x and y axes. So in this case, if it was on a scale of 1 to 6, we can assume if this was 5, and that was on a scale 1 to 6, take you to dots 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? So we, let's get you those dots, 1, 2, 3, 4, this one. Let, let's assume it is 6, 6, right? Let's assume the scoring is 6, 6. So what does it suggest then for this company that falls there when it's 6, 6? 6, 6, what does it suggest? So it means it is very, but not very high long. The, the, it says the company is very competitive. She said, and it's also growing rapidly within the market. Remember, the market is external. The market is external. So the market growth relates to the market and not to the company. Everybody understands that? It relates to the market, so it's not that the company is growing within the market, it means that it is in a market that is growing. So remember we also always speak about the life cycle. So if it is a market that is in, at a plateau phase, what does that suggest if the market was plateau? Where would it be at the top? And what happens when something plateaus? It begins to decline. So when it says slow market growth, where would it be on this chart? Where would it be on this chart? Right, so if you know your math and you would have done your... Um, Statistics, what do you call this point that occurs about here? It's called the point of something. Remember your microeconomics. The point, and it talks about the total, remember the total physical product curve on your microeconomics? 
The point at which what is the point at which diminishing returns occur? Y'all remember diminishing returns? <laughs> Y'all can't remember diminishing returns? Diminishing returns for every additional input, the output decreases and decreases and decreases. So it's called the point of inflection that beyond that point, diminishing returns will occur. That for each additional input, so in terms of a market, the more mature the market becomes, as you start to invest in the market and put products in the market, you get less and less returns because it is not growing. Customers are leaving the market. And the more money you spend in that particular market, you're going to lose your investment. So this chart tells you whether the market is in slow growth or whether the market is in rapid growth. So rapid growth is the point before the inflection where this market is really, as we call it, the steep curve. Remember in economics about the curve, a, a steep slope versus the falling slope. So similar concepts, you need to understand that when there's rapid market growth, it means there are opportunities. So the closer it gets to the bigger numbers on the y-axis, it suggests that this market is a positive market for investment because it is in rapid growth. Once it falls below the negative, it says the market is in slow growth. And when markets are in slow growth, companies have options too. Right? So if the company was plotted here, where there is slow market growth and its competitive position is not very strong, it suggests diversification, it suggests joint ventures. So why are you choosing joint ventures? That's it. To, to boost your competitive advantage. So you want to join with a company that might have a good marketing strategy or a good product line and you're trying to work collaboratively because again, the market is not very strong and your competitive position, so maybe if the two get together, you might be able to create synergies to enhance your competitiveness within a very challenging market. Correct. Rapid growth. Right. Looking at the various strategies you have in certain situations that are coming to the same thing. Well, this is really an app where you soon start to decline. Maybe I can then decline to move. But who said that? That's soon decline. Sorry. That's like understand this and what you were saying just now. I'm trying to just be quite understanding what you're saying. No, you're saying the opposite of what I said. I said that if a market is a slow growth, it suggests that it is at the point of plateau, beginning to oh, fall. Okay. Whereas in this one, really, if, is growing. But, but if you look at it, and that's a good question, right? It's a good question. And then why do the chart? If a, company, if a market is in, in, in rapid growth, it says it has to be here. Okay. Rapid growth cannot be here. So if it's in rapid growth, this is the beginning of the cycle. Of course, remember the product life cycle and the industry life cycle. So if it is in rapid growth, it has to be here. When it is going into slow growth, it's suggesting that it might be a mature market getting ready to decline. Oh. So, so for the, that's why I drew the chart. Look at the chart of the, the life cycle of a market or life cycle of a product. Right? So once you suggest it's, it's fast growth, it suggests at the beginning of the cycle. And as it gets older and older and older and older over years, it eventually might slow up. And the point I was making here, the point at which it slows when the market is mature, because of what? What makes the market mature? Saturated market. Saturated market. Many, 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 many players and many, 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 many products. Right? So once it gets to the point of slow growth, means it is maturing, get ready to fall. Right? <laughs> so in, in trying to understand it, just look at the chart, and it will help you to understand that once fast growth, early stages, slowing and mature, it begins to slow up in growth. Yeah. So if you look at the choices, market development, you can expand into another region. 
Market penetration, look for new market share. Product development, develop new products. It speaks about then the integration strategies. You can buy out a competitor. You can look to take more control of your distribution. Got the opportunities. That's what it is saying. There are a lot of opportunities in this market. Take advantage of all of these opportunities in this rapidly growing market. When it is slowing out, you say, well, uh, well, let's look at quadrant three. Right, just give me a minute. Look at quadrant three here. What is quadrant three saying? Slow market growth and be competitive position. So what do you say? Retrench. So this market seems to be dying. My company is not competitive. Let me start to cut down the staff as much as possible. Correct. And then it says then liquidation. I mean, need to shut down and move over to this thing, get over this one time. And diversification means then I need to put something new and fresh on this market. You know, I need to diversify. This product I have isn't working. Let me find something else. That's what it is saying. Let me find something else urgently. I need to diversify. Um, and a similar one for quadrant two, the competition, competitive position is weak. So it, and the market growing. So it means that, again, my company is in trouble. I might need to get out. I need to shut down one of my units or look some fresh ways to develop some products to make my thing live. You see, that's what it's suggesting. Okay. So, that's a good question. Any other questions on the grand strategy matrix? But the point, folks, is the axes. Pay attention to the axes. The axes tell the story. Whether in growth, or rather in decline. Any questions? You all comfortable? <coughs> right, so what, in terms of analysis, folks, again, I don't have an answer put down for you to answer. That's rote. I want you to think logically and analytically. There are various options. So what I want you to do in terms of your cases and in, in, in your exam, think through logically if the company is in quadrant three, there are various options. Which options do you prefer? And again, different students might choose different options. And remember, as I said, you're going to have your financial ratio table and you have other tables, could be the CPM, could be the EFE or IFE refer to those tables and documents to have an idea of the company's position. So you don't have to just guess. So you can make you and you can actually refer to when you look at the company sales. The company sales seems to have grown over the last year by 10% or the company sales are greater than the market. So you need to look at those things, right? Look at the year to date. Right? When we look at the financial ratio, look at the year to date, this quarter versus the next quarter. You can look at that kind of financial information. And then some students, you don't have to choose all five. Some students might determine retrenchment might be the best option or liquidation, but just justify it while you're choosing a particular option over the others. And just use logical arguments. Right? Liquidation seems to be best because when I look at the financials, it is obvious that sales have been declining or profitability has been low, that the company has, uh, uh, the profitability is way below the market average, right? And, and under exam conditions, you're going to have a column saying industry, and you will have a column saying the company. So you can make industry comparisons. So you could argue over the last five years, the company has been consistently below the market in terms of its growth, its, its sales, and in terms of its profitability. <coughs> Hence, it seems best for the company to liquidate and find some other kind of business to go into, set up a new business. And once you justify it like that, that you're referred to your ratios. If there's a CPM, you can look at the CPM, which also does comparisons, and look at the CPM and pull out the dimensions of the CPM, the success factors that the company seems to be doing worse than its competitors. Right? And that's all we want you to do, justify it. And you can have all the data there, data there to do, but just practice it. All you can do is to practice it and practice, practice. 
And once you do that, folks, there's no need for you to go in the exam trying to remember by rote. This is what you know, I remember from my notes. You don't have to go in the exam to remember by rote. You can go in with confidence that I understand what is necessary for me to analyze these questions and to come up with some logical solutions, right? So you have, we will have nearly about 10 weeks to practice. It's 10 weeks, how many weeks you got to practice? Not 10. <laughs> Six, about seven, yeah, about seven weeks. Right, well, you have the whole of November, right? Four weeks, and then the exam is on the 15th. Six weeks, right, you have about six, yeah, you've got about seven weeks. That's a lot of time, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of time. Well, if you're ready. What's that? Well, if you all, well, I am assuming you all took my advice when I said the first six to seven weeks are where you put in your most intense study. So you really, at this point, should not be going to learn basic concepts of what is by forces, what are competitive strategies, how to do a CPM. At this point, you should not be at that basic stage. You see, if you're at that stage, you've got a lot of work to do. A lot, a lot, a lot, lot of work to do, you see. Um, so, but there's still hope, right? You still hope, you still got a, if you're not there, you, you still have a lot of work to do. Sorry? We ain't even exam yet, man. <laughs> we deal with understanding. Okay, folks, if there are no more questions, we'll take a break and I will see my tutorial people at tutorials. Have a nice day.